we are now recording. Welcome everybody to the December 2019 edition of the Anthony Peak Consciousness Hour. This show is one I've been waiting for for an awful long time. Um, four years ago, or coming up four years ago, I did an event in Melbourne, Australia. And while I was there, one of my fellow presenters was a guy called Dr. Alex Defoe. And I was very intrigued by Alex's work because what Alex is doing is, is, in, is, is pure academic research in terms of extraordinary experiences. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about Alex in the sense of his background. Okay, I'm going to be reading something and because I'm on my iPad, I'm going to be looking in that direction. So it, I'm not being ill-mannered here, but I want to get this right. Okay, so Do Dr. Alexander Defoe is an academic and transpersonal researcher with 10 years of experience in the science and teaching of psychology. He has received funding from the Australian Institute of Parapsychological Research, Parapsychological Association US, and the Society for Psychical Research in the UK to explore the mind-body problem in relation to accounts of out-of-body experiences of the OBE. Dr. Defoe's PhD was awarded at Monash University in 2016 for the study of perceptual processes in illusions of mind-body distortion, such as induced OBEs, body transfer illusions, and other altered states of embodiment. Alex teaches predominantly in, into undergraduate psychology programs with a focus on cognitive psychology and perceptual processes in humans. For example, object, object recognition and perceptual realism. He currently supervises several PhD students ranging from topics from modern technology use to uncover perceptual processes to the hard problem of consciousness. He has published his work in various academic journals. Now, this to me is intriguing material because it is so important that this is actually taking place at the moment. And Alex, I know, is one of the guys at the leading edge. Now, Alex won't know this, but um, the last uh, Consciousness Hour we did, we discussed the experiential side of the experience. And now we're looking into the academic experience. So Alex, without, Alex, without greater um, greetings and everything, welcome to, to the Consciousness Hour show. Thanks so much, Anthony. We're really looking forward to uh, talking about this topic. Great, because I know just to explain to everybody else, this has been a logistic nightmare for us because our producer, Dia Nunez, is, is over in Denver, Colorado. I'm just south of London and Alex is in Melbourne, Australia. So you can imagine the time differences here is really quite complex. And it's one of the reasons why we've had difficulty in doing it in the past. So if, if Alex starts fading away or falling asleep, <laughs> we know it's purely and simply because I think it's, what time is it there for you? It's probably around 4 a.m. at the moment, so um, yeah, sorry everyone if I come across a little bit sleepy, but I think it is, as you mentioned, an important topic, so I did want to make the time so we can discuss this. Thank you so much, Alex. It really means a lot to me that you've actually done this. So in tell, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did, how did you ever get interested in this subject? What is it that intrigues you about it, and why, why are you doing it? What, what, what is it in your background that makes you interested in this? Right, so I guess my background is a bit unusual. Um, the reason that uh, most people tend to get into research and my approach was actually uh, based on uh, personal experiences that I had um, in the area with um, uh, mystical or transpersonal phenomena you could call. Um, having um, out of body uh, type experiences, uh, meditative experiences uh, in my late uh, teens uh, really drew me to investigate these topics. Um, I found that a lot of the literature at the time that I was directed to um, wasn't very satisfying and that there was a lot of um, you know, new age literature out there and uh, kind of explanations that took a number of um, leaps in logic that didn't really track very well. Um, having found, you know, some theories that uh, did stand up a, a bit more, um, you know, including some of your work was really fascinating um, at that time. Um, but I really wanted to um, get into the topic and look at, you know, can we, um, you know, test out some of these theories and uh, some of these models of out-of-body experiences and uh, transpersonal phenomena. And uh, it's, you know, not as easy as we might think. As you mentioned, there's a, a large sort of uh, phenomenological or personal dimension to the experience. And I suppose what I was interested in um, is that part, but then also um, the narrow approach of how can we actually conceptualise some of these topics and explore them uh, in a more controlled uh, scientific way. Uh, and specifically, I thought out-of-body experiences were a good topic uh, that lends itself quite well to that sort of investigation, um, whereas some of the other you know, 
parapsychological topics um, uh, like past lives, reincarnation and so forth, obviously a lot more difficult uh, to investigate. So in terms of starting somewhere, um, that's where I started my research, looking at OBEs, but of course, um, venturing into other topics that are related as well. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about your own initial personal experiences of OBEs? Because I'm quite intrigued whenever I have guests on here that's had the out-of-body experience and, and, and lucid dreaming and other phenomena as to what your sure. personal experiences were on that. So can you give, a, give us a couple of examples? Sure. So in terms of my personal experience, uh, I haven't had the sort of clear-cut uh, definition um, out-of-body state. Uh, but when I was younger, I used to have a lot of, um, you know, what you might call partial uh, disembodiment sort of experiences where you might be lying in bed and you kind of feel like um, you know, part of your body's lifting up or you kind of have two bodies that are um, you know, separated from each other. Um, I have, as I mentioned, I haven't really had the full on sort of um, sense of dissociation and uh, floating away somewhere else, but partial experiences, also partial experiences in meditation of that uh, loss of um, body self boundary, um, which again, um, I wouldn't entirely call a classical OBE. And this is what I actually found uh, fascinating in my earlier research, uh, that people describe these experiences so differently. And sometimes um, they will even talk about OBEs in terms of lucid dreams, in terms of um, dreamlike states or meditation states. Or you know, I've even had um, a lot of survey respondents and uh, interviewees talk about drug-induced experiences as OBEs. And, it's really interesting uh, the broad spectrum of definitions uh, you can have. And uh, I found that um, a, a big starting point was really trying to collate all of the data and identify what is actually an OBE and what isn't an OBE. Mm. So in that sense, um, I have had a lot of, um, you know, what you call transpersonal experiences. I don't know if I would uh, say I've had um, the full traditional sort of out-of-body experiences. Um, that people talk about, and I think in, in part that's important to differentiate from, you know, say, uh, what are the traditional characteristics of an out-of-body state versus a near-death experience versus uh, transcendental meditation experience, which people still tend to uh, conflate and consider as the same thing, um, whereas I think um, they're quite distinct. That's interesting because one of the big debates that um, I know that are in circles that I work in and, and work with over here in the UK and indeed internationally is the subtle difference between the out of body state and the lucid dreaming state. And are they just aspects of the same experience or are they very qualitatively different and actually ontologically different experiences? I mean, have you any ideas of, of where you, you would think on that one? Because I'm sure this is something you've discussed in great detail in the past. Definitely, yeah, it's a really good point. And uh, some of the really um, good research around that is by uh, Stephen LeBerge, uh, who found um, uh, quite a distinct overlap between lucid dreams and out-of-body experiences. And then in about, you know, maybe 30 to 40%, uh, percent, uh, we can see um, lucid dreams that may actually, uh, what would say, uh, translate or articulate into out-of-body states or um, vice versa, out-of-body states that might start off um, so you're having an out-of-body experience and um, you perceive yourself uh, standing behind yourself or floating above yourself, uh, but then that kind of, you float further away, that kind of transforms into a dream-like um, non-physical or imaginal realm. Uh, so he seemed to find that there was this percentage of overlap between uh, lucid dreams and out-of-body experiences where one might translate into another and, and vice versa, uh, which complicates things even further because I I think they still are distinct experiences, but there seems to be this sort of um, uh, overlap uh, between the two. And if we look at um, parapsychological phenomena more broadly and um, psi researchers like uh, Dean Radin and um, Charles Tart that have looked at um, various factorial analysis of different psi phenomena, uh, people that experience you know, one type um, are more likely to also experience um, other types of phenomena as well. So I think, um, you know, it is important to distinguish between them, but also to acknowledge that a lot of the time uh, these experiences can blend in, into each other. And, um, you know, in the same way, we could take the analogy that someone's having a regular dream uh, and then uh, they have some sort of reality test or trigger that actually uh, turns that regular dream into a lucid dream then they might, you know, again, lose lucidity and it might go back to a regular dream. So these states can be quite fluid in that sense. 
Um, but I guess from my research interest, uh, I've wanted to look at, um, you know, realistic out-of-body experiences versus um, imaginal states, as I found uh, that they're more fascinating, if you like, from a scientific perspective. So if someone's talking about, uh, you know, like a drug-induced experience where they've dissociated and floated off into a different uh, dreamlike realm, um, that's interesting from a, a phenomenological perspective, but it's hard to study from a parapsychological perspective where we might be wanting to look at what's going on uh, in their perceptual experience. Uh, and in that sense, um, more classical OBEs, um, such as those that uh, writer and researcher Graham Nichols talks about, with you know, leaving the body and actually perceiving the direct environment around them. Um, from my perspective, those sort of accounts are a lot more fascinating and uh, lend themselves a bit more to understanding you know, what happens perceptually uh, in those states. That's interesting in itself because you will know and a lot of the, the watch, I never know what to call them, watchers, listeners or whatever the term is for the people that, that actually listen to this show or watch this show. But, but Graham Nichols has been um, twice uh, to uh, be guests on this show. And I know that uh, both you and I have presented with Graham Nichols in the past. I think Graham was the year before I think I went down or maybe the year, no, it was the year after, wasn't it? I think when uh, when they did the, the event at I Ayers Rock. Sounds right, yes. Yeah, which is about right, isn't it, I think. But, um, but suffice to say, Graham and Graham's experiences are indeed fascinating because unlike other experiences, and I strongly advise anybody who's listening to this or watching this at the moment, if you get the opportunity, scroll back or check the interview I did with Graham Nichols because Graham's experiences are indeed intriguing because one of his experiences involved um, not only was it veridical, it was veridical in the sense that it actually anticipated a future event that happened five days later. Um, and and he had witnesses to this event. So this is even more intriguing in many ways because it tells us something about time flow within these altered states of consciousness. And Graham also talks about what he calls the cerulean effect. And this is something that actually be interesting to chat with you about because various researchers I've spoken to and experiences of the out-of-the-body experience all mention this shading into the blue. They actually, when they're in these experiences, the actual overall hue of the environment tends to be moving towards a different part of the spectrum. Have you come across this in your own research? To some extent, probably not as much as I expected. So looking at um, the perceptual characteristics of OBEs, a lot of the time people do talk about them as being um, fairly realistic to the regular perception. Um, but there are a few things that stand out. So some participants do talk about having um, a different color spectrum or they have a certain tint uh, to the experience. So some uh, people talk about, um, you know, like a, a blue or an orange tint over their perceptual field. Uh, I haven't found uh, too much consistency uh, around that, though, and that the experiences can vary quite a bit. Um, another common account is a 360 type vision. So rather than just seeing a narrow field of vision, being able to uh, see everything around them all at once, which is pretty fascinating. So I think that there definitely is um, some kind of uh, altered perception in OBEs uh, and probably um, broadened perception as well. Uh, and it's interesting that researchers haven't really um, investigated that enough. So if we look to some of the formative literature on OBEs, um, they're kind of taken for granted, whereas some of those fundamental questions of, um, you know, how is perception altered? Uh, you know, what does someone's spatial environment actually look like in these states? Um, researchers haven't really started off with those really important questions um, and uh, fleshed them out in enough depth. So when we have, you know, sci research uh, trying to look at, you know, is there something unusual going on in OBEs where someone is actually perceiving the immediate environment, uh, the experiments aren't designed as well as they could be. Um, so, for example, uh, some researchers try to test the sort of, you know, mind-body hypothesis that uh, someone can leave their body and perceive the environment around them. Um, but they haven't tested it in the most effective way. So to give one example of that, uh, one experiment looked at using um, uh, newspaper clippings to test uh, perception uh, out of body. Um, but, you know, again, um, participants couldn't really pick this up very easily. And first we you know, have to ask the question, um, can we actually read a newspaper while being out of body? Uh, and part of the reason um, that some of these experiments haven't been so successful could be uh, that perception um, 
you know, in out-of-body states hasn't been accounted for uh, very well. So we haven't, you know, taken into account these factors like 360 vision, uh, the fact that there might be, um, you know, color or depth um, impact on the experience and other factors that have actually greatly uh, limited what could be done with some of these experiments. Of course, the putting the um, my skeptics hat on, which I tend to try and do occasionally, is that one could argue quite reasonably the reason that people cannot read newspapers or get information and bring it back is purely and simply because they're not actually out of body as such. It's some form of very elaborate hallucination. Um, and they may believe they're outside of the body, but what they're doing is they're actually existing in their own model of what they think the external environment will look like. Because, but what has always intrigued me in my own research and my book on out of body experiences, I was particularly interested in the work of Charles Tart, uh, the work that Charles Tart did with Robert Monroe, and the particular case where Robert Monroe, Charles Tart asked Robert Monroe to see if he could visit his new house in California. And Robert managed to, and this is the strange thing, Robert managed to get about 50% of the information right, totally right, but 50% of it was totally ski whiff and it was totally wrong. And I think this is where I have a problem with this because if people turn around to me and say, I can get out of my body at will, I'm, my argument always is, well, it's an easy thing to do then. You get out of your body at will. You just go into the next room and tell us what's in the next room. But there's nobody I know that's ever been able to do that at will. Do you know of anybody you know that claims that they can do it at will and, and can effectively reproduce these circumstances? Or do you think this is, again, people believing they can, but they can't? Really good question. And it's something that I've been wanting to look at a bit more and uh, to try and consider, you know, can more experienced um, out-of-body uh, practitioners, if you like, or you know, out-of-body experiences, can they actually um, have this experience more consistently? Um, and it seems to be, you know, if that's the case, it's a very small uh, proportion of the population um, that may be able you know, to do that. Uh, so, of course, you know, Graham Nichols, um, you know, other you know expert practitioners um, such as uh, Robert Bruce here in Australia, for instance, claim to be able to have this ability. Uh, the degree. I, 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 I don't think Graham, I'd like to think that probably Graham doesn't, having met Graham a few times. I think Graham would readily admit that he can try and facilitate the circumstances, but I don't think he can actually do it at will. I don't think he's ever claimed that. I don't that's, think, I'm not going to corrected, but... That, that sounds correct based on my discussions of Graham. Yeah, it's, it's not so much that um, these people can just, uh, you know, close their eyes or, you know, go into a state and have an out-of-body experience at will. Um, I guess, um, you know, to maybe rephrase what I was saying, I think some of these individuals um, do tend to have out-of-body experiences frequently and probably are more susceptible uh, to inducing them than those in the regular population. Yeah, so if we point. take, you know, 10 or 15 participants from the general population uh, and compare them to someone like, um, like Graham Nichols or like Robert Bruce, um, we would expect that um, those in the second group would probably be more likely to have an out-of-body experience. But in terms of meeting someone that's just been able to do it at the drop of a hat or you know, every single time, I haven't actually encountered um, any participants like that. Uh, but I think it is interesting that some people are more susceptible. So if we kind of look at that sample or that you know, population of people that uh, can induce them um, more willingly or with greater success, uh, that would give us um, you know, more possibility to explore uh, the experience and especially you know to test some of um, these ideas okay that, because that's interesting in itself isn't it um, in the sense that if they are if they can spontaneously generate it what what is it telling us and as, a, as a, 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 a an expert in human perception as well it is intriguing isn't it because we know that we internally generate a model of external reality inside our heads all the time we're doing it now you know effectively well, there's no one-to-one -one relationship between our perceptions and what is actually out there because the brain is creating an internal model from the senses and pulling it all together and we know in terms of perception to think there's a one-to-one -one relationship is naive realism literally in its terms but effectively what is your thoughts then on the reproduce that the way of reproducing the sensation of the of the out of the body experience I'm, for instance the work of olaf blank what are your opinions on that? Because I know that you've been doing some quite similar work down there in Australia in terms of this kind of inducing the effect by using 
um, a virtual reality and, and, and videos and everything else. Have you been trying to reproduce that? And what's your opinions on that? Yes, um, yeah, really good point. So there has been uh, a lot of recent research, especially with the advent of virtual reality and other technology. Um, there has been quite a lot of um, recent work done into uh, body recognition and um, this notion of uh, body ownership. So um, some of the earlier research around um, phantom limbs and uh, this ex really famous experiment called the rubber hand illusion experiment. Uh, demonstrated that our uh, sense of body integration is actually pretty Alex, fluid. Could you just could you just explain to the listeners because I know about that experiment. It's fascinating. Sure, sure. Can you just explain it a little bit. So um, with the uh, rubber hand illusion, um, generally uh, there's a few variations, but the original one, um, the way that it worked is uh, participants were asked to put uh, both hands uh, on a table in front of them so they could see you know both hands inside. Uh, then they were asked to put uh, one of their hands uh, underneath the table and uh, a rubber hand or you know a fake hand was placed in the same position um, as their real hand was a few seconds ago and the experiment then uh, applies you know various different uh, variations um, and procedures so they might start you know stroking the rubber hand or tapping the rubber hand um, and that visual sense of actually having the rubber hand uh, in front of us uh, it uh, tricks our perception um, that it's actually uh, our own hand uh, and you know you might not think that you'd be tricked by it but if you actually have the experience um, you may find uh, that you're a bit confused about you know is this actually your own hand or not uh, especially with more recent sort of VR simulations of that that are more realistic uh, they've done variations of you know like the long hand or the long arm illusion where um, someone's arm becomes longer and longer, and they actually feel like, you know, their arm could reach all the way across the room. So there's that sort of tactile uh, realism that, you know, it is actually their own uh, hand that's been replaced. Um, and what this research has actually unearthed is that um, our body representation is really uh, amenable to those sort of um, tricks. And we find this in VR as well, having, you know, participants in a virtual environment for a prolonged period of time even if that's you know, 20 minutes or so and they're like in a very small environment so they're crawling around like a small perceptual space or a really large perceptual space when they take off the VR goggles uh, their perceptual experience takes a few seconds to kind of um, stabilize again so that sense of representation uh, is fairly easy for us to um, manipulate um, and this is where uh, some of the research around um, uh, looking at, you know, can we induce out-of-body states uh, using these illusion conditions that come about? Um, and again, it kind of ventures into that territory of what is an OBE. As you mentioned, some of the researchers have stated that they can induce uh, out-of-body states. Um, so uh, Blanky and uh, Eckerson also um, talk about this uh, out-of-body illusion um, that we can uh, apply the same principles, but rather to a rubber hand uh, to the whole body. So someone puts on you know, a headset or uh, VR goggles, and they perceive themselves standing on the opposite opposite side of the room. Uh, I think they've done an experiment having someone uh, with the perceptual experience of floating above themselves as well looking down on their body. And the idea is that we're inducing that same uh, out-of-body state. So um, in terms of your question, you know, are they comparable? Um, I think Phenomenologically, uh, they're different experiences, and I've touched upon this um, in various um, papers and in conference presentations at the PA that they do seem to be uh, quite distinct um, phenomenal experiences um, in the sense that usually uh, with an out of body illusion, uh, the person um, has that sense that they're you know above the body, but they usually they tend not to move around like you would in an out-of-body experience where you can actually float you know, around the room and explore other areas perceptually. It seems to just be restrained to that perceptual field in the same way as if we had a rubber hand illusion, um, you would have that experience just at the rubber hand and then the experiment is over and the perception goes back to normal. Um, so it is really a perceptually uh, grounded experience and a lot of the other phenomena that come with OBEs, um, like that sense of, uh, body separation, um, some people talk about sense of like uh, vibration or uh, dissociation tends not to accompany uh, a lot of these um, body transfer uh, illusions. 
Um, what I find interesting though is, you know, if we go back to that earlier point of, you know, to what extent can these experiences flow in and out of each other? Uh, one of the research questions I have, for instance, is, um, you know, can we generate really, really realistic um, body transfer illusion in, say, in VR uh, that would actually um, then lead on to an out-of-body experience? That would be an interesting way to maybe induce OBEs in future, but I don't know if the protocols and the um, technology is there uh, quite yet. You might be interested. I don't know if you've come across the work of Dr. Carl Smith over here in the UK at all. Um, he, no. he hopefully will be a future guest on the show. Uh, and Carl is doing some quite fascinating work. Um, I was at one of his presentations at uh, Breaking Convention at the University of Greenwich this summer. And one of the things he's doing is he actually has um, a, 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 a VR camera attached to his head which goes all the way around, three, uh, you know, 360. And it's fed back to somebody else who's in a virtual reality scenario headset themselves. And they do this for hours and days on end. And effectively, there is this great sense of disassociation and loss of, almost loss of self, I think. And I know we're planning to reproduce this going forward in the future because I've lectured, I've worked with Carl on other, other events. But it's intriguing, isn't it, that this whole thing can, can be brought back to things like, I know the explanation put forward, for instance, is doppelganger syndrome, you know, the idea of autoscopy or uh, autoscopy, where the idea is, you know, you see an image of yourself, which you can then project your consciousness into that other self. And of course, in OBE states, sometimes that happens, doesn't it, where somebody feels they're rising above their body. And it's quite intriguing, isn't it, how regularly, like Robert Munro, you know, I was looking down at myself and I could see myself lying there in the bed, which seems to be very similar to this, this kind of doppelganger syndrome. But I think you're quite right from what you say, the people that feed back to me say it's a very different sensation. One thing is an illusion of bodily position and uh, the pre pre perceptive st stimuli we're getting, which is completely different. And I think your point there was a fascinating one. I'd never thought about it before, was yes, the way in which you can, you can move your position of perception around a three-dimensional space while you're in these around while you're in these areas so this is very intriguing so in terms of um uh Olaf Blanke's reproduction of the OBA experience because I know there was an awful lot of press about this and I did a debate in London with with Graham Nichols and uh, one of his researchers at the Swedenborg Society in London about four or five years ago and you know, they've said that it's now explained it. It's now explained the out-of-body experience by this reproduction. I mean, as, as an academic researcher yourself, what's your opinion on that? Do you think it does explain it? I know you've said it, but, but could you just expand on that a little bit? Yeah, really good question. So I think that this goes back to that broader debate around, um, you know, the mind-body issue. And this can be traced back, um, you know, two, three hundred years um, back to Descartes' um, mind-body problem and um, I think it would be convenient if we can say that we've resolved it but I think the reality is that um, it's not quite yet resolved and um, this comes down to a lot of debate around parapsychology research in general in the media and uh, the media doesn't tend to do a very good job of representing a lot of those findings and that's not just with um, OBE or NDE research, but uh, in general, um, any sort of parapsychology work. Um, there was an experiment a few years back, uh, or actually almost half a decade back now, where they looked at uh, some kind of uh, hidden stimuli, hidden perceptual task, and uh, the fact that participants uh, registered a particular uh, emotion to this perceptual task, um, they basically, you know, they published this as a, like an emotional um, processing study but the media ran with that and then I uh, kind of framed it in a way that this um, shows that there's no such thing as a sixth sense or any kind of broader perceptual um, experience that it's simply people's unconscious mind that's playing tricks on them and similar sort of explanations have been used to talk about uh, synchronicity intuition um, that these are all processes that occur um, you know due to the unconscious mind or um, these phenomena that are completely explainable uh, and the same thing tends to happen with OBE and NDE research. Um, the problem is that a lot of these studies aren't really um, situated well in the literature so if we look back at uh, out-of-body um, studies these tend to um, 
go back quite far. And, you know, Society for Psychical Research, for instance, has been uh, logging uh, anecdotes um, of OBEs. We can even look at, you know, um, research by uh, William James and Carl Jung, the early sort of uh, psychoanalytic era and even before that, um, talking about some of these states. Um, whereas the problem with um, recent studies uh, that have tried to you know, explain these accounts, um, they've kind of approached it from the paradigm of uh, perceptual processes rather than looking at you know, this long history of accounts that have been reported um, throughout decades. And it kind of ignores a whole body of literature um, by doing that, um, which is problematic even just from a basic scientific perspective that researchers should be doing a thorough a literature review of a phenomena before uh, talking about it. Um, whereas some uh, really strict, you know, what you'd call really strict materialists uh, have a habit of uh, not doing that and just focusing on, you know, maybe the last five or 10 years. So to give an example of that, focusing on uh, rubber hand illusions or body transfer illusions, and then saying that that's enough um, explanative potential uh, to say that there's nothing out of the ordinary going on. Um, but not really considering that broader, you know, broader accounts, um, you know, such as some of the work by Charles Tard and others that have uh, looked at um, out-of-body states. So I think, you know, fairly this should be stated in a way that um, we don't know for sure. You know, maybe, the, as you mentioned, the materialist explanation um, is reasonably promising. Um, like, personally, I'm not convinced, but I think they make a, a reasonable argument for it. But... In general, in science, we should be acknowledging both perspectives rather than just saying that, you know, this one is correct or that one is correct. So I think to kind of go back to your question, we can't really um, unpack this without looking at that broader debate. And it's a debate that's important to consider. It's still going on now. The media tends to present this in a way that it's been completely resolved, that it's not going on at all. But if we look at discussions with uh, researchers, um, you know, take a materialist uh, such as Susan Blackmore, for instance, she's quite active still in um, scientific debate and she does interviews and, you know, discourse around these topics. But, you know, if we look at the media and what the general person reads, they tend to get the message that it's been completely resolved. But in the academic side, it certainly hasn't. There's still debate and discourse going on um, about this topic. Well, this is the thing that frustrates the hell out of me in the in the, in the same way and they will turn around and they will bounce back at you and they'll turn around and use such tropes as uh uh the 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 plural of anecdote is not the the plural the plural of anecdote is not proof but effectively if people have these experiences and the experiences are consistent across cultures and across society and across time it is bad science to just ignore them it's like the argument to say that uh, for instance synchronicities or coincidences you know, one could argue that sometimes synchronicities or coincidences or precognitions are actually evidence of precognition. But of course, they'll say, well, no, it's not. And they will come up with all the excuses. And then the final fallback position is purely and simply that statistically, you know, it, it could be it could have just been coincidence. But how how you know, I'm, I'm a trained statistician myself. And, you know, to me, there is a certain point where it stretches to such an extent the probability of this occurring as to be nonsensical. Yes, it could probably occur, but the reality applying Occam's razor, which they love to apply to us all the time, applying Occam's razor says the most simple solution is the most simple one. And I'll give an example of this, you know, that you'll still read in academic uh, books now, even to this day, in terms of deja vu. Deja vu was supposedly explained by Robert Efron in 1961 with his visual pathways argument. It's, it's dead in the water, that one, and yet they still cite it all the time and bring it forward. And to me, the only way we're going to understand the mind-body problem, the only way we're going to solve the, uh, the hard problem of science that uh, David Chalmers, your, your, your Australian philosopher, cited way back in 1999, is to look at these things in an objective way and say that just because subjective experience cannot be necessarily quantified in the laboratory or released does not mean it doesn't happen. You know, I know that there was an awful lot of problems with the Daryl Bem experiments that took place a few years ago and the furore over the, the Radin and Beerman experiments uh, in terms of, of, of people actually anticipating horrible images and these kind of things. These are all experiments that seem to imply that we can actually understand, we can actually perceive the contents of our own immediate future. But 
they never they're just in denial because it doesn't fit in with the paradigm now this is what is so exciting about the kind of work you're doing for me as an enthusiastic layperson is that you are pushing the boundaries you're being brave enough to to actually endanger your old academic tenure because you're willing to take these chances and look into things so i'm really interested to in know what 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 are you planning what are what are the things you are working on now and what are the things you want to work on for the future mm -hmm. So some really important points you made there, Anthony. I, I think it is really a paradigmatic issue a lot of the time rather than a, a statistical issue. And if we look at you know, results that have been published on SCI research, there's enough there to keep looking and to keep investigating. And um, it does come down to, um, to paradigms and um, what's the, you know, the current paradigm in, in science um, and what sort of research um, is acceptable. Um, and uh, that can be, you know, difficult to work with within the scope uh, as well. So I do try and, um, you know, continue research uh, in this field of inquiry. Um, but in the current climate of, you know, various paradigmatic approaches, it's not always um, the easiest to pursue some of these research studies. Um, so at the moment, I'm looking at uh, predominantly um, the perceptual experience uh, in OBEs. So uh, we ran a study um, surveying uh, a few hundred uh, participants uh, to try and get a sense of um, what their perceptual experience is like and the out of body experience. So um, really going back to basics and um, you know, looking at uh, when you're out of body, uh, what do you actually see? What does the environment look like? Um, how long does the experience last? And uh, these sort of questions. And uh, we're aiming to use that data uh, to inform uh, future experiments around uh, trying to uh, induce the out-of-body state. Um, so at the moment, we're applying <clears throat> uh, a paradigm, if you like, or a protocol uh, by uh, a researcher uh, named uh, Patricio uh, Trisoldi uh, in, uh, in Europe, who's uh, applied um, this approach called uh, hypno hypnotic-based induction of uh, OBEs. Uh, and he has had uh, fairly promising results with taking participants who have been um, uh, susceptible to hypnosis and uh, guiding them through an out-of-body type script to induce an out-of-body state. Uh, and then having some kind of um, target conditions, so getting them to, you know, can they float above the body and see particular you know, objects or things around the room. Um, and to basically, um, you know, test that out and to replicate that as many times as possible. Um, so we're looking at um, doing something fairly similar, but taking the original, taking the data from the original study to inform uh, that design. Um, so specifically, you know, avoiding um, objects that would probably be difficult to register, like uh, not using you know, news, newspaper clippings or anything like that, but using uh, objects that are quite um, easy to perceive based on what participants have told us uh, tends to be um, most perceptible in those states. Um, so not doing anything, you know, too radical or too drastic, but building on um, what seems to be working currently in, in research across the world, but also trying to um, refine that uh, based on um, what we know, what we've learned about perceptual processes. So um, that should be, you know, quite promising to see um, how that study unfolds. Uh, the main concern, um, I suppose, to go back to an earlier point is, you know, to what extent will participants be able to induce these states? And, uh, you know, are they going to you know, be able to do that in every instance? And of course, that makes it quite difficult to replicate um, some of these uh, results. But that's the general plan um, moving forward. Because that's so, so important, isn't it? I mean, it's, as, you, as you, you've mentioned a few times, you know, it's a paradigm thing. It's the way in which we have what is considered to be um, the correct view of what is taking place in terms of everything is just physical, everything is just physical objects in fields. And there cannot be any explanation as to how inanimate matter, effectively electricity reacting with chemicals in my brain can create me, my, my inner thoughts and feelings and anticipations. And that clearly with the eliminative reductionists such as Daniel Dennett and the Churchlands and everybody else would just be saying, you know, that. We cannot prove that within our present paradigm, therefore it doesn't exist. And it's a very, very peculiar worldview, isn't it? It's the idea that because we cannot measure it with our, with our devices of one description, or the devices we're using themselves 
are not the correct devices in order to measure in the first place. And the challenge that researchers like you have is finding a way of, of reproducing these, what seem to be ephemeral experiences under control conditions. And it seems that the very nature of the control conditions themselves seem to, to somehow stop the effect taking place, you know, or, or we'll, we'll kind of move the effect and disguise it in some way. And I think the future needs to be that we need to just stop this kind of doctrineur worldview. You know, I'm reminded of um, the, the, the criticism and indeed the, 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 the real destruction of um, Brian Josephson's reputation. You know, the, I think he's the only living Nobel Prize winner in physics in the UK. And yet his reputation has been completely destroyed. They stopped putting his, his face on a stamp purely and simply because he's interested in psi phenomena. You know, and that is so wrong in, in so many different levels. You know, it's, it's almost crypto fascism within the academic community because you're not allowed to follow up on these subjects as if you are, you'll be ostracized. Now, in terms of, of, of the things now that, that, as I said, the things that are exciting you at the moment, what I'd like to do now is to have a, a general discussion of where do you think where do you think we're going to go with this? Where do you think the world, what do you think are, are going to be the outcomes and everything else of, of these things? What, what do you think we're going to find? What would you like to be able to find, I suppose, in terms of your research? What would be your holy grail? So I think it's important to, um, you know, have, be open-minded with doing any kind of research. And um, I think that that is really important to have that kind of spirit of curiosity and, um, that is problematic when um, you know working within a particular paradigm or um, uh, having the threat that you can't you know do research in, in this or that particular area. Um, I guess for us in the current academic climate, uh, it, a lot of the time comes down to um, funding and industry support. But certainly in other places, um, researchers do get ostracised, as you mentioned, and they're told you know you shouldn't be investigating this or that phenomena. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, I think that's problematic, you know, in an academic sense in general, of being able to um, work with the topics that um, you're most fascinated in. Um, so in future, um, I, like, I'm not sure where the research will lead. And uh, I think it is um, a little bit disappointing that we don't have more researchers asking some of these questions. Uh, I actually uh, just um, the other week did an interview for Parapsychological Association asking um, you know, they were interested in asking how can we support the next generation of researchers um, in science and parapsychological phenomena. Um, and I raised a few points about, um, you know, the situation is a little bit dire at the moment and that not enough. First of all, not enough researchers are actually <clears throat> taking a, a real scientific interest in these topics. Um, but secondly, uh, that support is lacking um, as well. And uh, actually, you know, having mentors and supervisors that would encourage researchers to be quite open-minded and curious about these topics. Um, that's quite lacking and instead they tend to be pushed into particular areas of investigation. So um, <clears throat> at this stage, uh, I think uh, I would be curious about knowing, um, you know, really what distinguishes uh, out-of-body accounts from some of these other phenomena that people talk about. So trying to um, develop better methodologies uh, to test that. Um, as you mentioned, the instruments that we have are not necessarily um, calibrated to capture um, these experiences very accurately and in some ways this almost goes um, you know against the, the tenets of uh, the current paradigm uh, in psychology of trying to be as unbiased as possible and you know this sort of uh, thesis that um, if some kind of phenomena is going on we should be able to take a random portion of the population and test those people and we should see the same thing over and over it's kind of uh, counterintuitive with parapsychology because we're actually seeing these effects in a very small portion of the population. So in that sense, I'm hoping to work towards um, developing uh, more refined methodologies for actually um, you know, capturing some of these experiences and looking at you know, what is it about the personality characteristics or you know, other individual differences about these people that are having these accounts more often. Um, but then also, you know, can we induce them more frequently? And I think, you know, my hope isn't that we'll necessarily answer the, the bigger problem or, you know, the bigger sort of issues around this topic, but at least that will get a bit closer to understanding uh, what's going on and, um, you know, sorting 
uh, these experiences and uh, distinguishing them a bit a bit more clearly. And uh, hopefully that will pave the way for more new and exciting research uh, on the topic. Because uh, it's intriguing. I particularly like your line, the idea of actually pursuing psychological types in terms of, of, of particular individuals. What is it that makes a particular individual more likely to be psychic or more likely to have out of the body experiences? Is it a neurological thing? Or is it, is it a personality trait? So effectively, could we, using psychometric testing, OPQ, 16PF or whatever, and come up with a particular typology of individual that is more susceptible, and then we could actually find those individuals and develop them in some way. But of course, if it, if it is proven to be a, a psychological type, the implication is then that it's a psychological effect rather than a physiological effect, rather than related to particular aspects of neurotransmitter relationships within the brain, whether it is something to do with the release, release of glutamate in the brain, whether it is in, in endogenous DMT, if we, can, if we can argue that endogenous DMT excreted by the pineal gland, these kind of things. These are areas of research that we need to be moving towards. And I've long argued that what is happening is we're having siloism a little bit, you know, in the sense that the neurologists and the psychologists and the quantum physicists and even, dare I say, the cosmologists aren't necessarily talking to each other in the sense that there should be cross-fertilization of ideas in such a way that when the group works together, there'll be a little light go on and you as a psychologist will suddenly spot something and say, do you know, I hadn't realized that this, this known neurological or neurochemical effect engenders this kind of experience. And, you know, effectively, as long as we've got people that are in denial of these things, we're going to get trapped in it. Now, one of the things that I'd, I'd like to ask, I, I do these little speeches, you know, halfway through these, these things, so just ignore me on this. It's sort of word association in many ways, and I just start going off on a tangent. But effectively, in terms of the people you have worked with, have there any, been, ever been any kind of extraordinary experiences that either you have witnessed or things that you've you've come across in your research that you thought, you know, that really is quite incredible. I can't quantify it. I can't prove it superbly, but I know that this thing happened. Are there any events like that? Because I know that you're well experienced in these areas. Are there any ones where you thought, wow, that really is quite uncanny? <clears throat> yeah, there are a number of peculiar accounts that tend to come through. Like many of them will be um, fairly standard sort of um, out-of-body accounts, but <clears throat> you know, you'll get the odd account that uh, is really takes you aback because it's really quite unusual. Um, so, for example, <clears throat> people talking about uh, having an experience of, um, you know, going in, into a different um, time period or, you know, perceiving themselves um, earlier on in life and then, you know, talking to people after that out of body state, you know, family members and so forth and asking about, you know, particular details and getting really specific information around that. I've always found that sort of thing um, uh, quite fascinating. And uh, sometimes the level of elaboration that people will go into, it's um, yeah, quite fascinating um, uh, that they have these uh, sort of experiences. Sometimes I'm, you know, sitting there reading them and uh, fairly taken aback. Um, so those sort of accounts, uh, um, you know, too many to think of off the top of my head, but um, in, in general, transcendent experiences are usually um, quite fascinating. So I try and limit my research to looking at out-of-body states that are perceptually grounded in this, you know, physical perception. Uh, but some of the accounts that come through talking about um, uh, other experiences or non-worldly sort of states, so again, the amount of detail that people go into um, with those sort of accounts um, is, is quite fascinating. <clears throat> um, fairly similar sort of descriptions or a similar scope to those we might find in um, uh, works like this by Evan Alexander of talking about these sort of very rich sort of visual uh, landscapes that you wouldn't really even be able to, um, uh, to fathom um, if you try to imagine it. So those sort of accounts really kind of, you know, um, they, they take you back sometimes and are quite fascinating to read about. Excellent, because I mean, the, the whole Eben Alexander thing is intriguing, isn't it? In the sense that he was somebody that was very, very 
negative about the NDE experience. And of course, he then experiences the thing himself. And this is something I find quite regularly with, when I do debates with, with skeptics and with scientists. It's always the strange thing, you know, you, they, they, will, they will say, oh no, it's all nonsense, it's all rubbish and everything else. Then you'll go out and you have a few beers with them. And then after a few beers, it'll be, yeah, I don't believe in it all, but I did have this experience once, which I've never been able to explain. And then I give a wry smile and I listen to experience. And I will always turn around and say, well, why don't you then talk about this in your papers? And we have the same reaction. It's no, 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 I, I, I couldn't be allowed to do that because, you know, it would destroy my reputation. So we're coming back to this. But I think the major problem here, well, it's not a problem, but it's an issue of the world we are in because there are an awful lot of people out there that use the paranormal and use sigh and all these other things as a way of earning money and a way of pretending that they have skills that they don't have or abilities that they don't have and of course every time somebody is proven to be a charlatan and every time somebody is proven to be cheating or whatever it damages everybody you know and that these huge claims that are made by people you know the point we were making earlier on you know i can get out of my body straight away and of course every time these individuals are tested well no the special circumstances whereby i can't you know, and the skeptics will then have a heyday with that. And it's very, very curious and very, very strange and quite frustrating because it's people like you and I, particularly you um, and the people I've interviewed here that are really trying hard to, to understand the greatest mystery of all, consciousness and conscious experience. And what is, what is consciousness and how does it exist in a seemingly materialistic universe you know the, the point you made before about cartesian dualism um and the idea of you know there are two seem to be two separate things that exist within the world there's the inner world of consciousness and there's this kind of external world of physical objects but of course we know in quantum physics the physical objects when you start analyzing them and go down to the subatomic le level just disappear there is no physicality out there you know there's a wave function that is collapsed by the act of measurement or the act of observation just could have been anywhere, subcomic cars can be anywhere until they choose to be in one place or another. So in our final few minutes we've got now. Can I ask I like a to... question, Anthony? Yeah, Dia, please do. Yeah, please. And I know this, this is, is our producer Dia, by the way, folks. I'm just sitting here listening to your beautiful conversation, and this is a very mundane question, but it's deeper than <clears throat> what we're presenting. And what I mean by this is the scientific community your science why such the deep-seated fear is what i'm trying to understand that this could potentially be the greatest discoveries of like mankind and when i say that i'm not joking why what is the real deep-seated fear what are what is science afraid of is what i'm trying to figure out good point alex what would you say mm -hmm. Yes, it's a good point. I think, again, this comes down to this um, issue of paradigms and um, that the current paradigm is um, challenged probably a bit too much by introducing some of these ideas. You know, if we look at the basic sort of um, principles of physics and biology are quite um, challenged potentially by, um, you know, the, the promise of side phenomena existing. So, um, yeah, look, uh, I think that there probably is some fear for, for the general person like generally when i've spoken to people about um parapsychology or you know paranormal phenomena they tend to be a bit unsettled about it they tend to um you know start thinking you know are they going to be possessed or you know a ufo is going to come down and abduct them so i think the general person i think there is some level of fear around that um with the scientific community i'm not sure if it's driven so much by fear but the scientific process does tend to be quite narrow and, and based on uh, paradigms and based on um, you know looking at things very carefully and unless we're hundred percent sure about something not really moving forward with that theory or that that approach so um, yeah look I don't know if, how, to what extent it's driven by fear I think that um, scientists in general like quite often people come up to me and say why are scientists so close-minded I think generally scientists are more open-minded um, than the general person. I think that they're just very careful in accepting the conclusions unless we have um, very good evidence for them. And I think, um, yeah, again, it comes down to a paradigm issue. Um, I wasn't 
uh, trained in parapsychology specifically until uh, graduate level. I think the fact that people are not introduced to these topics, they're not even starting to think about them unless they really go out of their way. Um, then, of course, if you're confronted with a really uh, different or radical idea that challenges your worldview, of course, there's going to be some hesitation or some reluctance um, uh, about accepting that. Um, but, you know, again, um, scientific paradigms, if we go back to <clears throat> the age of Freudian analysis, if you talked about mindfulness-based therapy in that age, everyone would look at you really strangely and ask why you're not accepting um, Freudian psychoanalysis as the best treatment for um, various psychological problems. Um, the same way we confront these paradigmatic issues um, today. I, I, th I think I'd add to that and say that the present materialist reductionist model of science has been phenomenally successful. You know, effectively the technology we are using now is from materialist reductionist analysis. You know, you take something apart in order to know how it works. But of course, the problem is with consciousness, you take the brain apart and you find nothing. Um, you, find, you, you know, you, you confuse what you think is happening in the brain that you're measuring as being thought or being hopes or fears or qualia or whatever. And this is where the difficulty lies. And of course, as long as you, you're gonna take one bit out the edifice, the whole edifice could collapse. And suddenly we're in this position, like, like I was discussing with Dear earlier on before you came on, on, on Alex, that the issue that they've actually suddenly discovered that it's, it's highly like the universe isn't flat, which means if the universe isn't flat, effectively it's spherical. And if it's spherical, it means if you start in one point, eventually you end up in the point you started in. And of course, if space and time are the same thing, it applies that time is the same thing, that time is cyclical. And of course, suddenly there are all these questions being asked and they're saying that maybe our model is not right. But this is how scientific revolutions take place. And you know, the scientific revolution, the Aristotelian model, the Newtonian model, they all were very good explanators of the world as it was seen. And the scientists would use that worldview because, you know, you look at Aristotelian science, they, they, you know, with their epicycles and everything else and the way an object moved, they thought it through to the nth degree. It made eminent sense to them because that's what the world was telling them. And it's the same with our modern science. I don't think scientists are anti what we're doing, far from it. I think if we could prove it to them, then the doors would open. But it's our challenge to do that. It's our challenge to convince them and bring them on side, but not by making huge claims like an awful lot of the new ages do and talking this kind of new age waffle and word stew that they come out with, and particularly this exact quantum physics that they've now got hold of, that suddenly, you know, everything is quantum and that explains everything. You've got to understand what quantum physics is really telling you. You know, you've got to understand Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You have to understand Pauli's exclusion principle, because these are the things that, that work, you know, in many, many ways. But, but that's my little speech on that. Alex, I am sure that there's an awful lot of people out there listening to this are saying, I really need to contact this guy. I really need to check out his work and everything else. So in the final few seconds, can you give us how people can contact you, your website and everything else? Dear, we'll put it up anyway later, but, but just so you can let people know more about how they can contact you. Sure, definitely. So the easiest way is um, probably through my website, just uh, alexdefoe.com. Um, and people can find me on uh, social media and my contact details there and um, yeah, other information if they're interested in um, current research that I'm doing. Excellent. That's really good because I know you have a whole series of papers that um, I'll be starting to plow my way through in the next few months because they look absolutely fascinating. I mean, one here, auditory hallucination predict, predict likelihood of out-of-body experience. I mean, auditory hallucinations, we didn't even get onto that, how they can be linked in one way or another to OBEs. That is a fascinating idea. Absolutely. I wish I'd spotted that before. That is a real, that's a doozy. That is so good. <laughs> That is so good. <laughs> Maybe it's such a stage we can discuss that one because so many sure. people talk to me about auditory hallucinations as well. So it's fascinating work you're doing. Alex, I have absolute admiration for you in what you're doing. You, you guys are so important to, to us guys that are doing all the writing because without you, we wouldn't have the material. So you guys are so important. And it was wonderful meeting you in Australia a few years ago. And I'll be watching your work with great interest for the future. And I hope a lot of the listeners will be as well. Okay, everybody, thank you very much for, for listening in and checking this out.
um, Alex Defoe down there in Melbourne, Australia, and as always, the, the, the magical, ephemeral person of Dia Nunez that will pop in occasionally and pop out again. Without Dia, this show could not occur. So thank you very much, everybody, and we'll speak to you again in a month's time, or we'll see you in a month's time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.